Good morning. Uh, this morning we're very pleased to welcome back once again the Reverend Mary Hunter. Uh, she's always welcome here and she knows that. And uh, uh, the wee slight change, uh, because we're going over to the Sunday school, Mary will start from here and then when she comes back she'll go into the pulpit. Uh, and the Reverend McBride has enjoyed a couple of days' holidays. She will be back in the months tomorrow evening. And I've been handed an announcement here for the Brickland District Number 10 Family Quiz in the hall on Saturday the 5th of March at 8 o'clock. Uh, teams of six people. And there's a supper provided. And everyone's welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Lovely to be sharing with you again in worship. The one thing that I have discovered is that stairs are to be avoided when at all possible. So I will go into the pulpit when I come back from the children, but rather than slow the whole service up, I'll stay down here to begin with. Lovely to be with you, lovely to be sharing with you. But it does appear that as a, as a world, people go from crisis to crisis. Just as we can see, begin to see the ending for the pandemic, there's war in Ukraine. As I was driving over from Skava, I was listening to some of the reports on the radio, and the situation really is very critical. So I would ask that during our service this morning, we remember the people of Ukraine and the neighboring countries, and remember and call on Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. The theme of our worship today centers around that vexed question, what is wisdom? There are several books in the Bible that comprise the wisdom literature, Job, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and some of the Psalms are the best known. But as we worship today, let us remember the words of St. Paul, what seems to be God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Let us worship God. The call to worship this morning comes from the Old Testament and the book of Proverbs. To be wise, you must first have reverence for the Lord. If you know the Holy One, you have understanding. Let us pray. Into your house we come, gracious God. Into your presence we bring our lives and our loved ones. We come with joy and sadness, with hope and with despair, for we bring our whole lives into your presence. In our sorrow we seek comfort. In our joy we give you thanks. In our perplexity, we seek your guidance. As we worship you and praise your holy name, open our hearts to know you, our eyes to see you, our minds to learn from you, and our love to be kindled into the flame of service of you, our living God, to whom all honor and praise is worthy, from whom all hope is found and all joy received. Eternal God, into the peace of your presence we bring our restless lives. All through the ages people have sought you and found your faithfulness has no end. Your people journeyed by your guidance and rested on your love. So guide us in our generation that our imaginations may be fired with your truth and our hearts overflowing with your love. For without you, life has no source or purpose or destiny. Refresh our faith, restore our confidence, and lay your guiding hand on our lives. Loving Heavenly Father, you are so far above us that we cannot fully understand you. 
yet you are so deep within us that you understand our closest secrets. We come to seek your forgiveness. Forgive us for those occasions when love has not been the guiding principle of our lives. Forgive us for when we have been impatient with others, unkind and envious. Forgive us for when we have been boastful or rude or selfish or quick to take offense. Forgive us for those occasions when our love has grown cold and lost its faith, its hope, and its endurance. God, our Father, forgive our sins. Lead us away from our pride and conceit and enlarge our thought and make us more compassionate and sympathetic towards others. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first hymn is, Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? It's lovely to see you boys and girls. Now I have a question for you. I hope you can see it. Can you tell me what that is? Fish. It's fish, yes, that's the first one. Can anybody tell me what kind of a fish? Oh, no fishermen here. Okay, let's try it another route. What's your favorite fish when you're having a meal? Ah, I heard the right one. It's salmon. Now, that's a salmon that's called an Atlantic salmon, I'm told. Now, that's a bit smaller. You might have trouble seeing that all that clearly. Does anybody know where you can find that thing? Belfast. Yes, exactly. Belfast. 
And do you know why it was put in Belfast? Well, there are two reasons. One is when the Lagan River became cleaner and clearer, the salmon returned to the river. And so they had a salmon mosaic made up. But there's another reason as well. One of the things about the salmon is that a salmon is the Celtic, that's very old Irish, wisdom. The salmon is the fish of knowledge. And the story goes in Irish mythology that when one of the great druids of the, of the this is centuries and centuries ago, caught a salmon, he asked his young helper to f cook it for him. Because the belief was that if you ate a salmon, you would become wise. Well, the young man cooked the fish, but he burnt his finger on the fish and he licked it and got the taste of the salmon. And instead of his master getting the wisdom, he got the wisdom because he'd licked his finger. Now, that's the salmon. Anybody want to tell me what that is? It's an owl. You're very good. An owl. It, that's actually a tawny owl, which apparently is the most common owl in Britain. Tawny owl. Why? Right since Roman times, over a thousand years ago, the owl has been regarded as being the wise bird, the wise old owl. And then there was a lovely little poem written. The first time it was seen was around 1875. And then in the 1930s, there's this. I wonder if you heard it. A wise old owl lived in an oak. The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Now wasn't he a wise old bird? One of the things about wisdom and knowledge and understanding and all those things is that we have to learn them. But unless we learn them properly, we won't know very much. Now we have, in our church, we have the Bible. It's a book. It's a book full of knowledge. Absolutely crammed full of knowledge. And I can see it's in front of all, on all your tables. But there's one thing about the Bible. You read it. You learn from it. But if you want to be wise and understand God, you have to think about what the Bible's saying. Because the Bible is the stepping stone towards God. You have to go that extra step towards God to understand, to look for God's wisdom in the knowledge that's in our scriptures. So whenever you read the Bible, take it in, think about it, and decide what it's saying to you. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for the love and the wisdom and knowledge that you have given us. We give you thanks for all your teaching and all the teaching of Jesus. Help us to make that teaching relevant to us. Help us to apply it in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name as we say together the prayer he taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And the hymn now, I Want to Walk with Jesus Christ. Lovely to see you this morning, boys and girls, and all the very best.
the service, I wanted to, to have four readings. And I thought to myself, if I have four readings, then there'll be no sermon, no children's address, and nothing else as well. So I've had to cut them down and in order to make it possible. So the first reading comes from Proverbs chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. And I would encourage you to look at what's around these readings as well as what's actually in them, the two verses that I've used for the service. So Proverbs 9, beginning at verse 10. Listen for the word of God. To be wise, you must first have reverence for the Lord. If you know the Holy One, you have understanding. Wisdom will add years to your life. You are the one who will profit if you have wisdom. And if you reject it, you are the one who will suffer. Then the next reading from the letters of St. Paul. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. So be careful how you live. Don't live like ignorant people, but like wise people. Make good use of every opportunity you have, because these are evil days. Don't be fools then, but try to find out what the Lord wants you to do. And the fourth reading would have been Psalm 111, and I would encourage you to read that. But for today, we go on now to 1 Corinthians 1 verses 18 to 31, a passage which I have always found very confusing, but fascinating. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning at verse 18. For the message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost. But for us who are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholars. So then, where does that leave the wise or the scholars or the skillful debaters of this world? God has shown that this world's wisdom is foolishness. For God in his wisdom made it possible for people to know him by means of their own wisdom. Instead, by means of the so-called foolish message we preach, God decided to save those who believe. Jews want miracles for proof, and Greeks look for wisdom. As for us, we proclaim the crucified Christ, a message that is offensive to the Jews and nonsense to the Gentiles. But for those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, this message is Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For what seems to be God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and what seems to be God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Now remember what you were, my friends, when God called you. From the human point of view, few of you were wise or powerful or of high social standing. God purposely chose what the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise, and he chose what the world considers weak in order to shame the powerful. He chose what the world looks down on and despises and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is important. This means that no one can boast in God's presence. But God has brought you into union with Christ Jesus, and God has made Christ to be our wisdom. By him, we are put right with God. We become God's holy people and are set free. So then, as the scripture says, whoever wants to boast must boast of what the Lord has done. May God bless to us these readings from his holy word. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This morning I want to make a confession. I want to confess a sin. The sin of envy. I envy those who can read the Bible and instantly understand and see the way forward. I really do envy them. Yes, there are some stories in the Bible which are instantly clear and leave us in no doubt as to what's expected of us. But for me, there are whole swathes of the scriptures which puzzle and perplex me. Passages like the story of Cain and Abel, when it appears that God has been unfair in his dealings with the two brothers. Or the story of the workers in the vineyard. It seems to be unfair to those who have worked all day and only received the same pay as those who've labored for an hour. Or what was Abraham thinking of when he sent his wife and daughter out to appease the army pressing at their gates. There is no doubt about it. The Bible challenges us to think, to be alert, to seek its wisdom. Blind faith is something sometimes deemed to be a good thing. Yet blind faith alone, without the balance of reflection, and a desire to seek truth becomes an absolutism that ends up claiming my truth is the truth. For me, the vast majority of the Bible requires careful thought, wrestling with alternatives, struggling to know what the wisdom of God is. It's exciting and frustrating energizing and exhausting. In effect, the Bible challenges us to be imaginative, creative and sensitive and to listen more than to speak, to think as well as to act, to search deeply into the reality of human relationships and to wait on God and his wisdom. One of the tragic realities facing the church in the 21st century is the all too frequent shying away from the discussion of deep and difficult issues and questions. Serious discussion and living with a diversity of opinion is one of the most profound challenges we face in our ever-changing and increasingly diverse society. To affirm the glorious wonder of diversity is to discover the challenge and joy of being enriched by the other and their otherness. That's where wisdom begins. The basic starting point for wisdom lies not in intelligence, not in passing exams, or in knowing a lot about a subject. As Anatole France, a French poet, wrote, The fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself a fool. Seek wisdom along with knowledge. Knowledge is words. Wisdom is silent. Knowledge is understanding what is seen. Wisdom is knowing what is not seen. Without knowledge... One could not play the violin. Without wisdom, one could not play the music. Wisdom is the courage to know and feel the limits to our knowledge and an appreciation of all that there is to be discovered. Proverbs speaks about the generosity of wisdom, about the richness of the welcome of wisdom. 
Wisdom leads to maturity. The path of wisdom invites us to move from immaturity to walk in the way of insight, the way of God. Psalm 111 explores the freedom brought about by fear of the Lord. Fear as a sense of awe and wonder rather than a cowering before an ogre. For the psalmist, fear of the Lord is attuning oneself with the personality of God, being moved by the specialness of God. The result is to depart from evil, to do good, seek peace, and pursue it. In Ephesians, alertness is the word. The invitation to wisdom here is making the most of the time, focusing on the will and the personality of God. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he bluntly reminds us of how little we really understand of God. Jesus, in all his teaching and his words, had little to say about wisdom. Instead, he demonstrated what wisdom is through action, deed, and word. Wisdom is essentially relational. God's relationship with us, our relationship with God, and our relationship with each other across the globe. Wisdom in scripture is always feminine and is never confused with intelligence, exam success, or expertise. Wisdom reaches much deeper into what we are as human beings, bearers of God's image. We are communicators. We are communicators of the mystery and wonder of life, proof of the essential value that God knows each person to have. Wisdom sees the refugee, the starved, the vulnerable, and the marginalized, sees them as God sees them. Wisdom doesn't claim to know everything. Wisdom is not content to rest on the laurels of insight thus far gained. Wisdom claims no end, no end, to the journey into God. Wisdom emerges from that profound sense of mystery and awe. It is more than a sugar-coated sense of being close to God in the beauty of nature. Those moments are often used as an excuse for avoiding the demands or the pain of life. And for many, it is simply escapism. One reason for the weakness of the church in the 21st century lies in our distancing ourselves from wisdom. Wisdom is clearly part of the biblical witness. Yet how many of us are genuinely prepared to pursue wisdom? Strangely, often the present day advocates of wisdom appear not to be within the church. And we find them quite often in the arts. Many films have moments of profound and searching wisdom. Whether it's accidental or deliberate, there is often a challenge contained within the fiction. It's more than a little worrying that, as institutions, the churches seem more preoccupied with defending themselves or preserving themselves against division, rather than enjoying the discovery of yet more of God's truth to which wisdom calls us. Each of today's Bible passages centers on the divine. They express a journey towards the heart of God to center on God is very different from being bound by traditions or habit or routine. Tradition is essential. It brings with it the wisdom of past ages. But if not reflected on deeply in our own day to discover the shape of contemporary discipleship, it can also bring with it the limitations of the past. 
It can bind us, hinder us, and distance us from the challenges and opportunities of discovering how we are called to be present to God's people now, today. The, this is the way we have always done it. Or, if it was good enough for them, it was good enough for me. Type statements betray our reluctance to seek wisdom today. When people come along with insights, passionate concerns, or significant questions that challenge the way in which we are church, do we first explore what is of God in what they bring? Or do we instantly dismiss them as dis ridiculous, stupid, unworkable, nonsensical? We may end up saying that, but that's the end point, not the beginning. The journey into the life of God contains within it the essential ingredient of the journey of wisdom. The journey that is ongoing throughout all of life. The journey that never ends. The journey which, if we end it, denies God. To be open to this journey, to be open to the whole of God's creation, that's when wisdom begins. That's when we seek God and grow. Let us pray. Wise and loving God, we pray that we may be ready to listen and learn from the wisdom of the past and from the scriptures. May we be ready to listen and learn to the voice within us which teaches us patience and understanding. May we be faithful servants on our journey of faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In our prayers of intercession and thanksgiving today, let us focus our minds on the wisdom of God rather than telling him what to do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have shown us the way of life. Help us to walk in your ways and to do your will. We pray for all who are seeking after truth, searching for wisdom. Guide their way, lighten their path, and encourage them on their journey. We pray for all who seek to make our world beautiful, for musicians and artists, sculptors and gardeners, actors and singers and dancers, and all who entertain. Gracious God, we thank you for the many gifts you have given us. We pray that you will teach us to share our talents in our communities. May the joining of heart and hand and talents enrich our communities, our congregation, and our families. Lord of light and hope and peace, we pray for all who live in darkness. The darkness of war, and we think especially of the Ukraine and the nearby countries. We pray for all who live in the darkness of illness. The darkness of loneliness. The darkness of sorrow. May your light shine, O Lord, dispelling the darkness and enabling hope to shine through the misery. 
We pray for all whose lives are limited to accomplishment and success. Give them the joy of knowing that there is more. We pray for all who have closed their eyes to the suffering of others. Give them the wisdom to see how happiness comes from caring. We pray for all who are weary of life and long for peace of heart and mind. May they know companionship and contentment. For those who have traveled this life with us and who now rejoice in the peace of heaven, we give you thanks and pray that we may come at the last to be received by you in your heavenly kingdom. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, Help Us to Help Each Other. God, who is the ground of hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you live the life of faith, until by the power of the Holy Spirit you overflow with joy and hope. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you all, now and always. Amen.